for summer. We're centrally located in the heart of the River Valley, just minutes from Greenwood and Fort Smith, between Barling and Lavaca, one mile east from the Fort Chappie entrance. We're a biblically based family. We're made up of ordinary people, serve an extraordinary God. We're comprised of a variety of folks with all kinds of different backgrounds, but we have one heart and one goal, and that's to experience authentic, spirit-led worship. So our focus is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, is to love God and to love people. Our worship times begin every Sunday morning at 9.30, followed by our life groups for all ages, where we look at the truths of God's Word in our lives. If you'd like more information, you can look us up on the web at firstsbc.com or on social media at firstsbc. You might be new to the area, might be looking for a, a place for your family, purpose, whatever it may be. We would love to experience our time with you here at First Southern.
Good morning. You guys doing all right? Pretty good. Pretty good. Y'all awake? No one's awake. Because the first thing I started realizing when I was telling people this morning, hey, how's it going? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm here. It's a lost hour of sleep. Yeah. Spring forward. Isn't it, don't you just love it? Isn't it great? Hey, uh, if you are a guest and you did wake up an hour earlier, that we are so thankful that you are here with us. And in the back of these chairs where you are sitting are these welcome cards. And if you could kind of reach back there and fill it out as you get an opportunity and put in the offering plates, which are scattered throughout the congregation, that would be really helpful for us. You can find some in the lobby, find some over here on the table. Um, that would help us out to get a chance to know who you are. Um, at congregation, we are also going to have a spring work day on April the 3rd, Saturday, April 3rd, starting at 8.30 a.m. And you should be well rested by that point because you know what else is going to encourage you to come that day? Food, some biscuits, some gravy, maybe some donuts, something like that. But what we really need is like we do every year is that we try to prepare for our Easter service, our Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate. And so we come in, we try to get lights changed, we try to get some flower beds rearranged, we try to get some things done around the church. So if you're interested in helping out with all those good details, come on April 3rd, we could use you. Which also means that on April the 4th is Resurrection Sunday. Guys, can y'all believe that it is just coming around the corner? And uh, we are planning on having two services, all right? So here's your homework that I need for you, because we're going to ask you, Russ and myself, we're going to ask you in a few weeks which one you're coming to, okay? And now, it's not going to be hard and fast. We're not going to write your name in a ledger to make sure that you're in the right service. But we need an idea of which one we're going to be coming to, because we're going to have Multiple different guests that we would like to be able to make sure that we are taken care of, okay? So uh, be sure to know, go talk with your family today about whether or not you're coming to the 9 a.m. service or the 1030 one, okay? Be helpful for us to know about that. I want to read this passage out of Psalm 68. And before I do that, um, I want us to continue to understand that we have come. We've come to worship the Lord. We are here to learn about Him. We gather as a congregation to serve him alone. This is what Psalm 68, verses 3 and 4 say. But the righteous are glad. They, they rejoice before God and celebrate with joy. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord. And celebrate before him. Let's pray together. Lord, I just want to ask that you help our hearts should be awakened today. That even though maybe we're a little bit sleepier because of the rest that we did not receive, I pray that you just invigorate us to see who you are. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing it. How great thou art. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all.
shall come with shout of acclamation. A love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. A hope of nations. Savior, He can move the God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I surrender. singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, sing it. Savior, he can move the mountains. Sing it. My God is mighty to save. and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. And Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to 
singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Sing again. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. That's why we sing, for the glory of the risen King. Amen. He's coming on the clouds one day. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the lion. For the lion and the lamb. Oh, so open up the gates, make way before the king of kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Sing it. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring. Fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. that say amen today. Amen. God bless you. Be seated. Pastors. Now, Russ, I have to tell you, I did not make the coffee today. Who, who made it? Alex did, and he wanted me to tell you something. Isn't that right, Alex? 
Yeah, he's quiet up there. He said he made it a little strong for us today. Praise I, God. I think we needed it, though. I think he made it strong for himself today. <laughs> I'm going to stand here just for a second, all right? And I'll tell you why I'm going to stand while you get that ready. Are you going to stand, too? No, I'm going to sit down, but I have to pour while standing here. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I'm going to stand here for a second is I just want to begin today by saying this. I, I praise God. Uh, we praise God. Everyone, staff, Lee, and... Alex and Cheryl, Tina, every, everyone's a part of, of what takes place here. Uh, w w when this began several weeks ago, we began, I know that the coffee seems to be the theme around here a lot of times, Daniel, but anyways. <laughs> I don't um, know what you're talking about. Pertaining to where we're going, just something the Lord laid upon my heart specifically, and even how to go about that, the way in which we're doing this. I, I say I praise God for you because not a one person in this room over the last five weeks has said this hey, we really like what you're doing, and no one's really said, hey, I can't stand what you're doing. You know what you're doing? You, you show up, you worship the Lord in spirit and truth, and you give him praise and glory. Amen. Whether it's a little bit out of your comfort zone or not, and I say that because I've had conversation about this and that, and I'll just be frank with you, there's a demographic at one certain point that above says, I don't know if I really like the sitting down thing. So Rob, I'm standing today just for a minute. Here, I'll come over like this. Is his foot going yet? Is his foot going? A little bit, all right? That's the inside between us, all right? Because uh, it used to, uh, the conversation, not this aspect, but more of the, the preaching aspect. And so that'll happen, Rob, a couple more weeks, bro, all right? And we'll be starting back at Easter. As a matter of fact, I'm excited because we're going to be going out of this, the book of 2 Thessalonians, all right? And so I want to kind of get in this way today just to make some of you a little bit more comfortable, all right? All right, now I'm going to sit down. You want to stand at the table today? Nope, I'm good. <laughs> but uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about, and it wasn't an appropriate day. I, I didn't even think about this being Time Change Sunday, and we're talking about the church today. I hate Time Change Sunday. <laughs> I don't, a vigorous I don't, amen. I, I don't yeah. hate many things in this world. Matter of fact, I think it's just the devil and Time Change Sunday. But anyways... <laughs> We're talking about the church today, and I don't think it could be a, a more pertinent time uh, because when we start talking about church, we talk about uh, what's involved with church. You know, people have all kinds of thoughts. They have ideas. They have beliefs about what church is, about what church is supposed to be, or how it's supposed to operate. And more often than not, when I hear someone elaborate or talk about that, usually, usually, not in here, but in the world aspect, it's not based upon biblical definition or truth of what we see what church is. It's based upon their opinion, thoughts, or ideas about what church should, should be. Mm. And so we got to be careful uh, once again. Matter of fact, when I was, here I go, I'm, I'm done. You just stay there. <laughs> uh, I, I was out this week, and we were uh, preparing for our time here, and uh, as we do every single week. You guys don't know this, but we kind of just meet just for a few minutes and just ask the Lord to speak and move within each of our hearts exactly what he wants to do and how he wants to go about that. So it's not prepared, written down that I'm going to say this and you're going to say this. That's not how it works. We just ask the Lord to move. And so this week as we're preparing for this time, thinking about the church, I had the opportunity to, to, to meet a friend of mine. I hadn't got to see him in a while. I wanted to take him something. He said, hey, uh, son's playing ball. Won't you swing by the field and see this, that, what have you. I said, man, that'd be great to see some of those guys again. And sure enough, I uh, got that opportunity. While they're kind of watching the game, what have you, and it was a close game. Things were taking place, seeing some guys I hadn't seen in a while. A guy sees me from a little bit of a distance, and he begins to make eye contact and waves. And I say, hey, how you doing? After about five minutes, I see he just keeps looking and looking. And his boy's out there playing ball. It's a one-run game. It's going to go into extra innings. It's all this. He goes, he goes, preacher, how are you? I said, good, how are you? He said, can I talk to you? I said, you're more than welcome to talk to me. And these guys, and you guys know how it is. Uh, in basketball arena, you kind of sit with your family, what have you, football, what But in a baseball game, all the baseball dads kind of stay together. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Softball too, you guys know what I'm talking about. And so there are all these guys, they're all the baseball dudes. I was never a baseball dude, but I was standing there and anyways. And he said, uh, I got a question, something I'm really struggling with I want to ask you. I said, ask him. He said, it's about church. Is that okay? And while the game's going on, all these dads turned and looked. And I said, Lord, this could come at a better time, could it? <laughs> it's Thursday night of the ball game. I said, just know this. If you ask me this question, I'm going to answer it from a biblical 
perspective and from truth, not from my opinion, your opinion, or anyone else's opinion here. He said, that's what I was hoping for. And so while the game's going on, this is what I see. Watching the pitch and listening, watching the pitch and listening. This is all taking place. And so he even struggled just for the first, and, and you don't have to worry about it. He is where he is. He's a friend of mine. He will not be listening, watching, has no idea what's taking place here in any way, shape, or form. So I'm not worried about that. If he is, praise God, the Lord will use that just to affirm his faith. Amen? Amen. So I began to ask a question. He said, man, I just, I'm struggling. I said, talk to me, brother. He said, I'm just struggling about church, what it is, what we're doing, and where we're headed. Hmm. And I went, Wow. This is a grown man at a high school baseball game. What does he want to talk about? I said, do you have a cup of coffee? There you go. He just looked at me funny. It's okay. I said, come to First Southern. We'll take care of you. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the church today, I want you to take your Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 16 just for a brief second. Now, I'm going to hit this passage briefly. Daniel's going to come back to it here in a minute and hit it a little bit harder, so to speak. And he might even send you some other places as well. When I talk about church, when we hear the English word church, it usually has a number of different meanings, most of what we associate with the religious aspect of it. But the Greek word, when we see church used in the New Testament, is the word ecclesia, all right? It's the word ecclesia, that church, uh, and it's a little bit different situation. Now, if you are a non-believer in the first century church, and uh, when you hear that word church or ecclesia, it was not referred to as a religious term because the church was brand new, and it literally just meant a gathering, gathering yeah. or an assembly, all right? We know that. So when you, when you said there's an assembly or gathering people, church had a different connotation. According to Vine's expository dictionary, when you look at the word ecclesia, it means out of or, or a calling. We use the word kaleo. We had a kaleo ministry uh, here in our association several years ago that a lot of folks, matter of fact, a, in, a, in the whole Southern Baptist Arkansas, Southern Baptist Convention, uh, folks who have been called, the word kaleo to call out to. Uh, and so they use it specifically in, in the New Testament. And if you were to back up and look at uh, the Septuagint, the first five books of the Old Testament, not in Hebrew, but in what? Greek. Greek. All right. And if you were to look at then, it has a, uh, does the same thing. It designates this gathering of God's people. It literally says, gathering of Israel summoned for any definite purpose or a gathering regarded as representation of the whole nation. All right. And so when we talk about the church in the New Testament, more often than not, it's used for something specific and new. And we're referring to us as believers or the body or Christians. Now, in the New Testament, they use that word ecclesia in it because it had a, this new mindset. And when the church met, they were meeting on a daily basis. And so as they met, this assembly, this gathering is taking place. They said, that's the perfect word used for what is taking place. Now, I say that because I'm kind of setting up because he's going to be throwing some more meat at you in just a second. But I set that up to say this. Now, the church, the church is not just us meeting here right now. Please understand, the church has been for thousands of years already meeting. And some, the most important, are around the throne right now. Do, do you understand when I say that? So don't think of the church just right here or there, across the street, down the road, what have you. The body, the body is gathered around the throne, and one day, all those who know him, we will worship there forevermore. That's the church, all right? So that's a great thing. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, it says, God has raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenlies. Now, the, the supernatural church Always around Christ, we praise God for that. That's not just not the future aspect, but we're, we rejoice in that. So I want you to look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, because of what Jesus says so beautifully and so powerfully in this passage. I'm just going to read it part to you because, like I said, you're going to get it here in just a second. I tell you, you are Peter. And Peter, that word Peter, the Petra, the small rock, and upon this rock, he refers to himself, not Peter. I will build my church. Make sure you understand that today, church. This is not referring to 
the person of Peter. He's referring to himself. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What a beautiful passage we have in Matthew chapter 16 about the church. I've had people say to me, I've had people say, email, talk, whatever it may be, that they have a distrust for the church. I've heard that before. And I would urge every single one of us. I've said this from this pulpit many times, and I will say it again very passionately. Please be very, very careful when you're talking about the church. Because you're talking about the bride of Jesus Christ. You might have a distrust of people. Get in line. That's, that's the mean side of me. I'm sorry. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to say that to the younger generation. I've, I've, I'm learning, y'all. But it's the truth. We're always going to have a distrust for those around us, are we not? Why? Because we're human. I have a distrust of myself, folks. Matter of fact, my alarm went off this morning. I said, no. Anyways, you know what I'm talking about. We will always have a distrust for people in that aspect because of our humanness. That's what makes the, the church so special. We're not ours. We've been bought with a price. We are his. So he paid the price for us to be a part of his bride. And there's nothing greater, there's nothing greater than being a part of the body of Christ. Now, being a part of the body, that's a great truth, but there's also other aspects of that which we're going to look at. Actually, function is given in Scripture. Uh, we also see for us, when we are a part of what God's doing in, in the body, that's a great blessing as well. When you're a part of a body that's doing exactly what we see from the Word of God, that's a great blessing. We're going to talk about that. And so today I, I kind of titled this a little bit different, The Church, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. <laughs> and that's exactly what we know. There are some great things that happen in the body of Christ. There have been some things throughout history that have been bad, and to be honest with you, some that have been very, very ugly. And that's just the reality. Matter of fact, if you, if you do some homework, there's going to be points in times today. Today will be a great day to be able to have some homework because you're probably going to get a nap at some point in time. It's going to be raining this afternoon, praise God. All right, And so you can have some opportunity to do some research. Uh, matter of fact, if you look back through history, why was it called the Dark Ages? Why was it dark? Because there was no light? No, it was dark because why? The church were keeping people what? In the dark. And so there's been some tough, 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 tough times, obviously. And so for us today, the emphasis is going to be about the church, the body, who we are. And as we begin that, here's what you need to know. You need to know your role. Roles and responsibilities we have within the body. The first and foremost is this. You're about to hit there. Is Jesus is the head of of the church. Amen? Daniel? As in all things, you have to understand that whenever you walk into a place and things seem to be kind of in disarray, one of the first questions you ask is, who's in charge here? Like, what is going on? So I think we've, before we kind of go to the foundational aspect of where our roles are going, we first need to ask the question of, well, who's in charge of the church? And of course, as you mentioned, Jesus is the head of the church. And I think that's something that we kind of misconstrue, right? Because sometimes we think that the pastor is the head of the church, and that is not correct. It's actually Jesus Christ is the head of the church and all the analogies that are given. I know you want to say something about that. Nope. No, you say just go with it. Okay. Take my glasses off. Take your glasses off. All right. So not only understanding that who is in charge of the church, that being Jesus, then we need to understand where the foundation lies and the power in which it lies, and that is in the gospel. And so the first thing I want to go to, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 real fast. In fact, you can hang out in Ephesians if you wish to, but I'm going to be going, bouncing around lots of different places. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23 says this, And he, God, and God subjected everything under his feet, Jesus' feet, and appointed Jesus as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Colossians 1.18, basically talking about the centrality or the preeminence of Christ, the importance of who Jesus is. 1.18 says this, Jesus is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Who's the head of the church? Jesus is the head of the church. He calls the shots. 
He calls the vision. He tells the direction where we go. Now, the problem that we sometimes see is whether or not the pastors in the congregation are willing to follow suit where the master is wanting to go because it is his kingdom that we are here to spread and his kingdom to continue. Now, you may ask yourself, like, well, what is the role then of a pastor? And like, so why do they exist? In which case, I'm gonna, you can go to 1 Peter chapter 5 for that. Um, and which, by the way, here's some homework for you. So if you want to know about qualifications, did you know there are qualifications for elders or pastors and deacons? You can go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 for that. So write down 1 Timothy chapter 3, and that will be your homework, okay? So what is a pastor? What are they supposed to do? First and foremost, a pastor is an under-shepherd. You may be thinking to yourself, like, well, what in the world are we talking about as an under-shepherd? Let me explain. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. I exhort the elders, also another name for a pastor. I exhort the pastors among you as a fellow elder and witness up to the sufferings of Christ. This is Peter writing. Peter's basically saying, I'm a pastor too. I've witnessed Christ's suffering, as well as the one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. This is his command to those who are shepherding God's flock. This is what he says. Shepherds God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but be an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Who's the chief shepherd? Jesus That's is right. the chief shepherd. What does that make other pastors? The under shepherds, That's right. the many shepherds. Okay, so what is the role of the pastor? With that, you can go back to Ephesians, if you wish. Ephesians chapter 4. And he, Jesus himself, gave us to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Here it is. Equipping, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry. That word, I'm going to say it again. Equipping the work to build up the body of Christ, that is the church, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing in maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. What is our role? Our role as under-shepherds is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It, isn't, it doesn't just fall on the two of us. It is impossible it is impossible. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it's like, do you think it's, it's possible for us to know every single detail about each one of your lives? And the answer is no, it's not. As much as we strive and as much as we would love to and as much as we want to, really, because we love our congregation. We love First Southern. We want to know who you are. We want to know your passions. We want to know where you're suffering. We want to know how we can encourage you. But it's going to be impossible for us to do everything. That's why we all, as a body of Christ, work together for the sake of the kingdom of God, as Jesus Christ, as the head of the church, Amen. not us. He has called us to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Verse 16 here in Ephesians 4 says this, From Jesus, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Each individual part. We come together as the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. All different roles, all different gifts, all with a desire and an unction to make sure that we are furthering the kingdom of God. That is each and every single one of us role. You can go to 1 Corinthians for that exact same thing when Paul basically says we were part, we're members of the body of Christ. And not members as like in a uh, uh, as in a country club country membership. Club. Right. I think that sometimes we get that really confused in our understanding of what does it mean to be a member of the church. Like, hey, are you a member? We're not handing out membership cards, are we? We're like, hey, are you a member at First Southern? You can come in and use the baptistry whenever you want to. No, that's not how it works. We're talking about being a member means being a part, an individual as a part of a whole. We are all united under the headship of Jesus Christ. That's right. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Practically speaking, Daniel, I'm like, all right, so, all right, I understand. All right, I have a role. I know I need to do something. So what is that thing I need to do? Before I get to that, there is one more key aspect that I want to make sure that we all understand. That to be a part of a church, you must be a Christian. Because if you are under the headship of Jesus Christ, 
you must be under the authority of Jesus Christ. And to be under the authority of Jesus Christ means that you are a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I go back to Matthew chapter 16, which uh, Russ went so brilliantly over a moment ago. He says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, others, and Jeremiah, or other prophets. But you, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. If you go to verse 18, Jesus looks at Peter and says, on this rock, This confession, the confession that you know who is the Lord of your life, the confession by the fact that you say that Jesus, that me, the Messiah, I'm boss of your life, on this rock I will build my church. Where does the foundation of church lie? It lies on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of what he came to do. And he gives us this promise. The gates of hell will not overpower the gospel. It will not overpower the confession. It will not overpower the church. If you ever think to yourself that, whoa, this time is is unfathomable. We're, We're going through lots of crazy things right now. Guess what? Don't fear, brothers and sisters. The gates of hell cannot come against the church. The church will prevail because Jesus Christ is the head of the church and nothing comes against him. Amen. Woo! It starts by believing, doesn't it? Amen. But everybody here is a believer. Everybody where we live is a believer. See, that's when we get to what you said about being the assembly and that the idea that, guess what, guys? If you could take this building right now and lift it off the ground where all was left was the foundation and you could shake out all the people on the ground, guess what? We still have a church because the church is not dependent upon a building. It's dependent on the people. And the people being that of the people of Jesus Christ. Boy, like, Daniel, that sounds mean. That means you're excluding some people. That's what the Bible says. Janie just gave you a yep. Yep. A strong, that's like an, that's an Arkansan amen right there. A yep is, a, is an Arkansan amen. 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 But the reality is, is that the gospel does exclude. And that's why that our mission and our purpose is to spread the message of Jesus Christ. So that way there will be coming to Jesus. Amen. First John 1 John 1.12, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. To amen. those who believe in his name. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is a declaration of allegiance. When we say that Jesus is Lord, we're bowing the knee before him and we're looking to him saying, we are giving our allegiance and our devotion to you. That is what it means to follow Christ, to take up our cross and to follow him. All right, Daniel, all right, Daniel. So what does this mean practically? What do we do? Well, we'll get to that, I think. We'll get to that. But in the meantime, what else does this mean? It means that if you want to be a part of the church, you must first declare your allegiance to Jesus Christ. If you are not a Christian, come to know him. He is a good God. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's abounding in steadfast love and forgiveness. We also understand, though, that Scripture speaks about justice as well. Balance and the way that the Lord approaches that every knee will bow and confess and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. It means that Jesus is our high priest. It means that Jesus is our high king. It, it, it means that we don't need to go to the pastors for confession. For confession, Because we have a great high priest that his name is Jesus. Amen. You do not have to come to us for that. What it means in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, it says, as you come to him... A living stone, basically Peter's saying, you as a Christian, you're a living stone, rejected by the people, but chosen and honored by God. You yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you may be thinking, wait, so now I'm a priest. I didn't realize I was a priest until now. Now I'm supposed to offer sacrifices. What kind of sacrifices are we to offer? I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in the view of mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, yourselves, your lives, as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect 
will of God. If you continue reading after that in Romans 12, more homework for you, you will see how Paul lines up, how every single one of us has a role and responsibility within the church. It may look different, but it all serves the same purpose. Which, by the way, as Jesus set up as an example for us, his example was death on a cross. And when he says to take up his cross and follow him, our lives are meant to follow. By the way, if you wonder, there are two, uh, as we talk about in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there are two positions, elders and deacons, pastors and deacons. You can read about that. There are also what's called two ordinances. You know what they are? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, or we continue to think about what Passover right now. Jesus said in the upper room, take this cup, take this bread. This cup, this is a representation. This wine is a representation of my blood, which is going to be spilled out for you. This bread that you're about to eat is a representation. It's a memorial. It's a representation of what's getting ready to happen to me. This way it tells his disciples, my body is going to be pierced. It's going to be broken. It will die on a cross. I'm doing this for you. Do this as often as you take it in remembrance of me. The same thing happens with baptism, which we are getting ready to celebrate today. Amen? Amen. Baptism is another picture. It is another representation of what's going on in our life. We don't sprinkle magic fairy dust in that baptism, do we, Pastor? No. At least I don't. No. I don't know what you do. She you, is wearing sparkles today. She's probably wearing so sparkles So it's going to be today. interesting, yes. There, that water up there, there's nothing special about it. It's water. And it is heated today. I did check it. It's heated. It is heated today. Thank you, Relba. But the brilliant part of it is it represents a life being put under the grave and coming back out of the grave to rise and to walk in newness of life. Amen. That if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. That baptism water that doesn't save you, it's just a picture of what it represents about what Jesus has already accomplished by his death and his resurrection. The Lord's Supper Baptism, all of these point to the head of the church, and his name is Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is. All right, Daniel. Okay, so what we do, we do, right? So Jesus is the head, pastors the under shepherds, Jesus is the chief shepherd. So I understand that I have a role, I have a purpose. Then what do I do? That's what we're going to talk about next week. Amen. If you want to understand what our role, what our vision, for First Southern, for the whole church, for what the Lord is going to continue to show us, what your responsibility is as the congregation of the people, the flock, the shepherd, as the over-shepherd, come next week. We're going to be able to talk about why we exist and for what purpose. I believe it's going to be a good day. Amen. Amen. If you would, bow your head with me right quick. Praise team's going to make their way up. Allison, Lindley, you guys go ahead and head that way. Just an opportunity for us just to stop for a moment and reflect on what the Lord has done and what the Lord is doing in the hearts and lives of his people. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord, as your master, as your savior today, he speaks, he calls, and he draws to a relationship. It's the greatest day of your life. Just because you are born in this area and your grandmother and your grandfather or your mom or your dad love the Lord does not make you a Christian. Just by walking in this place does not make you a believer. It's His calling in your heart and life and a heart that's surrendered to Him under His Lordship. It's that conviction and then that cry out for him to do what only he can do. So, Father, be glorified in the hearts and lives of your people and be glorified in your church. And we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, stand, oh my 
again. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Yes, I worship Your holy name. Worship your holy name. Amen. Be seated, church, ready for baptism. Amen. Okay, Lindley, come here, hon. This is the official hugger of the church. Stand right up here, sugar. All right, this is Lindley, and Lindley and I have been talking for a while, and mom and dad and grandma and family, about what it means to follow the Lord in baptism, right? Actually, it's been going on for several, several months. A couple weeks ago, Lindley came to see me with mom. Remember what you said? You're sitting in your chair, it's just you and I, and you started to cry. And I said, why are you crying, Lindley? She said, can I ask Jesus in my heart right now? I said, well, yes. And she did. She asked Jesus to be the Lord and the master of your life. Amen? Okay. So why don't you turn this way? 
right there. Lindley, you asked Jesus to be the master of your life, to die for you. Yes. And I baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bury Christ in baptism. Raised to walk. Newness of life. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Thank you once again, and we were so blessed to have you be a part of the service here at First Southern today. If you have the opportunity and you're in the River Valley, we would love to have you be a part of our corporate worship service Sundays at 930 to 1030 at 12 West Central in Central City, Arkansas. Bless you and have a wonderful week.